This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. It is another in my series of shows on the lies and ideas of major philosophers. Bertrand Russell is up this time. Peter Stone is a professor of political science, and he will be talking about Russell for the next hour or so with me, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Bertrand Russell is the subject. The man before you is Peter Stone. Uh, and he is going to be discussing the life and times and ideas of Russell. So welcome, Peter. I like to give my guests a few minutes to give a little background about themselves before we delve into the meat of the matter. So if you could tell me a little bit about who you are, what you've written about Russell, and why you have been interested in him. Sure, thank you. I'd uh, be happy, uh, happy to do that. Um, well, I have been interested in Russell now since the uh, early 1990s, probably for about 25 years now. And uh, I, uh, after I discovered his ideas, I got into his interest in him because of his background as a great peace activist, actually, not originally for his work in technical philosophy. And then I discovered that Russell was such an amazing, a faceted individual. Uh, you could uh, study him as a peace activist. You could study him as a great humanist and critic of organized religion. You could study him as the great logician. Uh, you could approach him from so many angles. And that made it very easy to, to remain involved with studying him for uh, years. Uh, so uh, while doing that, I've written a number of things about him. Uh, I have written, for example, uh, recently I wrote a biography, a, a biographical essay about him for the uh, international, uh, new uh, Writing Blackwell International Encyclopedia of Political Thought. I also edited the book recently, right here, I can show it to you, yeah. called Bertrand Russell Public Collection, which got published last year uh, by Tiger Bark Press. And I'm delighted to have said it. It recently uh, won the Bertrand Russell Society's annual book award uh, for the best book last year on uh, Russell. Uh, so uh, I've, been, I've written a number of things about him. Just one more thing to mention I have written that might be of interest because it's also good as an introduction to Russell. There was a recent issue of the magazine Philosophy Now devoted to the man, there he is, in all his glory. And uh, I have an article in that, and there's a bunch of other articles approaching, again, Russell from a number of angles and capturing what kind of a fascinating, multifaceted philosopher he was. Well, let's uh, give a little bit of overview before we delve into specifics of his ideas. Um, I was born in 1965, uh, 1965, and the Vietnam War was going on for the first decade or so of my life, and Russell was a big name then because of his anti-war stance, uh, but it seems to me that in the four decades or so since his death uh, and with the end of the Vietnam War, that he's been overshadowed by more continental philosophers. My first show, for example, on philosophy was on Jacques Derrida, and uh, I had, uh, uh, I, he has the, the name like Foucault, Wittgenstein, Nietzsche, that there's, has this sort of uh, feeling of uh, uh, exoticness uh, with just the name, whereas Bertrand Russell is a plain Anglo name. Uh, in fact, when I did the Derrida show, uh, they, the people I interviewed correct me on his pronunciation, and I got an email saying, no, they were pronouncing it wrong, whereas it's hard to mispronounce Russell. Do you think just in a pop cultural sense that Russell... Uh, is not as sexy a sounding name as Foucault, and this is one of the reasons maybe that that he doesn't ha he doesn't linger in the mind the way he did back when I was a child. Or am I wrong? D does he? Do you think? Or maybe in America he isn't. No, I think that's a very fair uh, sense. I think there is a certain kind of image of what people are uh, associate, or some people associate, with a public intellectual, uh, whereby you kind of write this very radical kind of stance and you say a lot of radical things and you um, defend these radical sounding things with a bunch of very, very obscure sounding stuff where you're not quite sure what they're talking about, but they seem so smart. Well, gosh, they must be right or something like that. That's the way I would certainly describe someone like Derrida. And also for that matter, someone like, like, like uh, Zizek is probably the most, uh, one of the most famous names in political thought right now. And I think that um, he definitely strikes that kind of pose very well. And you're right, by comparison, Russell's not only an easy name to say, uh, but one thing you will immediately notice if you start reading any of his popular writings is that he's a ridiculously clear writer. I mean, he's not always right, but his ability to just make it, make 
make ideas sound as easy as they can sound. Even when he's writing up difficult subjects, you get the sense when you're reading Russell, you know, if you're not getting it from Russell, you're not going to get it anyway, because uh, he, he's making it about as clear as the subject we approach. That's kind of the opposite of a lot of public intellectuals. Yeah. Um, these days, I know uh, probably about 10, 12, 15 years ago when they started doing the Narnia movies and C.S. Lewis came back into the public sphere. I remember there was sort of a mini bump in pop cultural uh, awareness of Russell because of his famous Why I'm Not a Christian stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis someone like Lewis. But uh, that seemed to have been just very brief. Let me just ask uh, uh, briefly, because I guess in the pop cultural milieu, that's that's the work or, or the idea most associated with Russell, you know, why I'm not a Christian. Do you think that's fair, and do you think that overshadows other portions of his work? Well, I think it, it, is, it is fair in the sense that it's one of the most important and in, uh, influential things that you've done. It's also one of the things I would highly recommend people read if they want a, an introduction to Russell. The collection of essays, Why I'm Not a Christian, and other essays is a wonderful place to start. Uh, not just because it introduces Russell's critic of religion, but also because it introduces his more positive attitude towards the world, expressed in wonderful essays like "What I Believe," which you can find in that uh, in that collection. Uh, so uh, I think it is it is a hugely influential uh, part of who Russell was. It was a very small part of him as a sort of a professional philosopher. You know, when Russell wrote about his criticisms of organized religion, he was kind of doing so the way someone like uh, Richard Dawkins did. I mean, you know, today, you know, with books like The God You know, Dawkins is not a professional philosopher. Um, obviously, his biology informs his stance on religion. And in the same way, Russell's philosophy informs his stance on religion, but he never considered himself like a professional philosopher of religion. Even when he did things like engage in the famous debate with uh, Father Coppelston uh, and the like, so it's, I think I think uh, his, his, I would say his work on his on, uh, criticism of organized religion is um, justly famous. Uh, it's justly something he's remembered for. I would hope people would use it as an introduction to Russell, and they would not stop there. Would you consider him somewhat of a bulldog in the Dawkins mold uh, for atheism or? or non-religiosity, uh, or, you know, was he more someone who was conciliatory, willing to let people believe what they believe, but, you say, when you get into the idea of trying to logically defend that, you can't. I mean, what? where was he temperamentally? You know, that's a really great question, because one of the fascinating things since the new atheists like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins came out, is a lot of people, they like to play the game of saying, oh, well, why can't you be like one of those good atheists, you know, the ones who are not as aggressive and nasty as people like Dawkins. And sometimes you can see people mention Russell as an example. And it's like, you know, that would be the last thing in the world people would have said about Russell during his lifetime, that he was a sort of one of the good atheists or something like that. Um, he was very aggressive in his um, attitude on the subject, and I think aggressive for similar reasons to contemporary figures, because they would say, look, um, religion, uh, is, you know, while it's all well good to say we should all live and let live and let people believe whatever they want, that's fine, except that certain religious believers are driven by their beliefs to take certain kinds of actions. Um, that is in, uh, has an enormous impact. Russell's father, for example, was a member of parliament, and he was hoping for a political career, and that all got destroyed because the man gave a speech in favor of contraception. And it's like, you give a speech in favor of contraception, that was just it. Dead. You know, he was dead in the water politically. And so uh, I think Russell would say, gosh, in a world where religion drives people to do, take many of these kinds of uh, statements, against contraception, for example, against any kind of family planning. It's a little hard to say, let's live and let these ideas. Yeah. Uh, I said that this was the second in my... Uh hopefully ongoing series on major philosophers. But if you Google Bertrand Russell, he's almost always, if sometimes not more, referred to as a logician. And I want to just ask you if you can uh, parse that out, because people will talk about Nietzsche as a philosopher, but they don't call him really a logician. Uh, the, the, the meaning should seem to be obvious to me, uh, or to anyone you know with a basic understanding of English. But can you parse out why someone would specify him as a logician and a philosopher. Sure. Well, 
is one of the big areas of research within philosophy. Uh, and it's all about this kind of question of, uh, you know, uh, how do you um, uh, prove things? You know, how do proofs work? What can you make proofs about? What are the elements of proofs? Uh, how will they proceed? And trying to do so usually in a very formal mode. Uh, so you, you, that's why it's associated with a lot of kind of ma ma mathematical uh, symbolism, it's how it's usually done. I mean, there's a whole branch you know, called symbolic logic because it both functions in that mode. And Russell was one of the people who in the modern era really ushered in the modern study of logic. I mean, he studied other areas of philosophy as well. For example, uh, areas you might associate with Nietzsche, like uh, epistemology, you know, the question of what can we know and, and what, is, how is, what is truth and that kind of thing. But, um, but logic was sort of the area where he made his biggest splash, his biggest contribution, the part that really established his reputation. Uh, in, in this day of uh, burgeoning artificial intelligence, does uh, Russell have any sort of uh, linear descendants? Uh, has he any influence in that field, do you think? Well, I think uh, it, uh, you have to talk about the genealogy of who was influenced by the debates Russell was influenced by. Uh, the way that the story is told, and it's a controversial story, but I'll give you my version of it, um, is that uh, Russell, what Russell really set out to do is to show how from some basic ideas uh, uh, you could prove the entirety of modern mathematics. You start with a few concepts in logic, and you can build up from there and prove everything that there was to know about mathematics. You can evaluate every claim in mathematics, say that's true, that's true, that's true, that's false, that's false. Many people interpret uh, Gödel, Kurt Gödel, uh, and his incompleteness theorem of coming along and saying, well, oh, that's impossible. In fact, it's not possible to uh, show that every single true statement out there is provable is, uh, is true or false. And that led, in many ways, to the founding father of the modern computer, Alan Turing. Alan Turing is the guy who came along and said, well, could we build, what kind of machine could we build that would be able to prove things or not? What would that look like? And that was kind of the very first um, effect that the use of the modern idea of building a computer. So the, the modern computer kind of comes out of some of these uh, arguments about logic and how, and, and how you prove things. Um, that having said that, of course, uh, Russell's own work in logic, you know, like any work in a, in a, a progressive field less than a hundred years ago, it's considered enormously influential, but of course it's out of date, you know, I mean, people have done much more, they carried the frontiers of the field way beyond where it was in Russell's time. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, and I, I want to get to the biography in a moment, but uh, as we're talking, things come up. Uh, you mentioned earlier the clarity of the prose that Russell used vis-a-vis -vis a lot of the continental philosophers. And it's interesting, when I do these shows, sometimes you get these uh, sort of synchronicities that happen. I just recently did a show with a, a guy on Robert Frost, and I was talking about the poem, The Road Not Taken, and how that's so often misinterpreted as, uh, and I won't get into it, but I'm sure you probably know of the poem and how misinterpreted it's been. And I was also thinking of, for example, in science, Schrodinger's cat, how often that is misinterpreted as saying that, well, anything could happen, the cat is in a state of superposition, when in fact Schrodinger was using that mockingly to say that in the real world, not the quantum world, the cat is either dead or alive. He can't be dead or alive, and he used that mockingly. And it seems to me that in society, especially with postmodernism and hipness and everything's ironic, that the clarity of ideas and words that someone like Russell espoused have been lost so that things such as subtlety in a poem, say, of Robert Frost, or such uh, the, the sort of sly mockery that Schrodinger was evoking in his uh, uh, idea about the cat in the box, have been totally lost because people don't apply basic logic. People don't read and they don't write with any clarity anymore. Do you think that, uh, uh, in that sense, that Russell uh, is, is more vital than ever? Well, I, I think uh, Russell is one of the people who has done more than anything else to provide a very good role model for what it means to write clearly. And he wrote about the subject specifically. He wrote a nice little book called The Art of Philosophizing, which talks about if you want to do philosophy, here are some ideas for how to do it right. But it's funny you mention about uh, how easy it is to misunderstand something. I can't resist it if you don't mind telling the story about one way that Russell could be misunderstood, not because it wasn't clear, but because he was capable of being really 
put it at sarcasm and satire, maybe the way Schrodinger was. So there's a passage in his wonderful book, The Impact of Science on Society, where Russell is very concerned about the growing population. He's worried about overpopulation, and he fears that all outdated ideas, superstitious ideas against contraception, are going to get in the way of being able to deal with this problem. And he sarcastically has this passage where he says, well, if you don't like um, birth control as a way of dealing with uh, this problem, well, there's other options. You know, war has been trying to weigh the population down, but that's maybe not working as well these days. So, you know, you probably have to rely on starvation and disease, uh, you know, to keep the population down, you know, you know like that. And he's obviously, if you have any brains at all, it's being sarcastic. Now, there is a, a, a videotape I watched a while ago, it was by this loony conspiracy theorist, uh, one of these people that AIDS was created by the United States government as this kind of plan of genocide or whatever, to kill exactly 1.25 billion. That was something in the show he kept saying, to kill exactly 1.25 billion. Not 1.2 billion, not 1.3 billion, no, 1.25 billion. And guess who's on the cover of the this videotape, but Bertrand Russell, with that quote about um, saying, oh, we're going to have to use these and all that to kill all people, ah, uh -huh. and all that, it's like, oh boy, you, sarcasm's just dead, sarcasm really is dead, if you misunderstood Russell on that one, really. Well, uh, let's uh, segue to uh, a little bit of the biography. O other than uh, the the anti-religious uh, belief system, he's probably also quite well known for his uh, belief in what was known as idealism. And I'm w I'm wondering if you Google his name, you know, he has a, a quite lengthy sort of title behind him. Uh, and I'm wondering if being born into, uh, if not royalty, certainly aristocracy, how how that affected him? What kind of family life did he come from? What was the family, you know, devotees of noblesse oblige? Uh, where, what was the milieu that he entered the world into? I think noblesse oblige is a very good uh, word to use in connection with Russell. Uh, Russell comes from a very aristocratic family background. His family had been part of the British aristocracy ever since the days of Henry VIII. Uh, one of Russell's uh, ancestors was uh, uh, an associate of Henry VIII, and so his family had been uh, part of the aristocracy going back that far. Uh, his grandfather was a uh, uh, prime minister of England twice, uh, Lord John Russell, and for his services, uh, Queen Victoria made him Earl. He was the first Earl Russell, and then Bertrand Russell became the third Earl Russell. Uh, and he was definitely brought up in uh, an atmosphere where he was constantly surrounded by influential and important uh, people, and, and uh, kind of took it as his due that he was associated with influential and important, uh, important people, and also uh, was based on a very strong sense of expectation that uh, you would then do something uh, for the world, something meaningful. And his gr uh, grandparents originally imagined he's going to go into politics, he's going to be the one who's going to go into become the next prime minister or something like that. They gave up on his older brother because his older brother was a bit of a scamp. They thought, I, I, it's not going to be him. It's going to be Bertie. He's the young good kid. Um, and uh, Russell originally went to college with the idea that he was going to become a uh, politician or something like that. He was going to study economics and learn how to, how to give speeches and all. And while Russell certainly remained involved in politics as a life, he found another way, uh, another path that uh, interested him. But that sense of... Um, both being an, an important person, but also an important person with a lot of responsibilities, never did leave him. Mm -hmm. um, I'm someone who generally tries not to read so much about the background of people when I read books. I'm more interested in reading what they wrote. Uh, it's not necessarily that I'm a diehard new critic, but uh, uh, I think sometimes we we conflate uh, a person's life with themselves. And so I was just surprised, I was just looking uh, online and uh, to see that uh, Russell early on uh, was a devotee of Percy Bysshe Shelley's poetry. What was his view towards the arts? Because when I think of Russell, generally speaking, uh, just as a man, my idea is that he had a very real politique view of the world, but uh, his de his devotion apparently to Shelley was quite intense. What was his view on the arts vis-a-vis -vis, uh, real life? Well, I think he had a very strong uh, streak of artistic interest in him. What makes this a little complicated is the fact that Russell himself, as a philosopher, never really got into the, the question of the arts, like aesthetics is actually the one area of philosophy where he really wrote nothing. I mean, it was never something he talked about. But uh, that never did not mean that he did not have a deep appreciation.
appreciation of various forms of the arts. Um, he, there's a line where he somewhere says that, um, you know, after listening to Mozart, it's hard not to feel just like a word or something like that. So deeply interested in music, uh, deeply interested and appreciative of uh, poets like Shelley. In fact, uh, he was very proud at the end of his life. He lived at a uh, home uh, in a place called Plas Penry in uh, Wales. And uh, he used to, was very proud of the fact that he said you could you know, look out over the valley, look out of his back window, and see a home uh, where Shelley came from. Uh, so he was uh, deeply connected to that. He was also deeply connected to uh, fiction as well. Um, he knew uh, and uh, greatly admired a lot of fictional. For example, um, both of his sons uh, were named after Joseph Conrad, uh, who he greatly, who he greatly admired, and he met and, and struck up an acquaintance uh, with. So uh, he was uh, you know, uh, greatly appreciative of arts, and very easy to miss that if you don't. Pay attention to the bottom. I understand what you're saying about why there are reasons to pay attention to the idea and not the man, but it's easy to get the wrong impression if you read the ideas and then say, oh, well, that must mean I, no, I didn't care about art or thought that had played no part of life. Uh, just looking here, it's, it says that his first published work was on uh, German social democracy uh, uh, just before the turn of the 20th century. Um, and uh, I, I want to just ask politically uh, did, did Russell have. Uh, uh, an evolution of political thought over his many years, because he lived to almost a hundred. Uh, was he someone one who was formed early in his belief systems? And what was his belief system, for example? I mean, we we live in this binary world, whether it's communist, capitalist, whether it's uh, the West versus uh, Islam. Uh, was he a binary thinker? Was he someone who saw lots of shades of gray politically? Um, you know, because he he went went through World War One, World War Two, uh, and he's writing about German social democracy. You know, even before the First World War. Uh, tell me a little bit about the man and his political outlook, how it evolved or not. Well, it definitely, and I could talk probably for the rest of the whole hour on on how it evolved. But uh, you know, he came out of a family background that was very, very, very much a liberal reformist background. It was a progressive background. It was was open to new ideas, although obviously, you know, kind of mainstream. Given you know, his grandfather was a prime minister and all, um, but he, anyways, uh, embraced the more radical elements of the Russell family legacy, and that was definitely there. You know, one of his ancestors, he always used to like said today, uh, was executed in the Rye House plot. You know, the plot. There was a plot in the 1680s to uh, kill uh, King Charles II and his James, because they were worried that they're going to reinstitute Catholicism in uh, in uh, Britain, and so one of Russell's ancestors was involved in that plot to wind up getting executed for that. So he had a, his family had a radical streak to their politics, and that kind of informed him. He was very much a socialist for most of his life, not an orthodox social democrat and not an orthodox uh, communist. Uh, he was more of what we call well, guild socialist, uh, which was more popular at the time, it kind of become eclipsed with this idea that the way you should organize an economy is it should be a worker-run economy that organized through guilds. You would have you know the people who work in one industry would be organized and they work and they would uh, uh, associate themselves together and they figure out how to organize it and they work together with the other and they would be doing so under a um, uh, a government which would attend to other affairs, you know, to public uh, issues of com uh, public goods and that kind of a thing. Uh, with a very strong streak of federalism, you know, Russell was a very big believer in federalism and the idea that, you know, small is beautiful. Yes, you want it to be the people who work in uh, our office who decide how it is run, but of course then you've got to figure out uh, how your industry is going to be run together with people in other offices. So there's a need for a kind of a federation of. And that informed also his uh, is on world peace because he very much believed in a form of world government, but a very limited world government. The world government that needs to be there to, for example, prevent wars, but it's not going to take responsibility for doing everything. You know, you need a world government to take out the trash. Yeah. Um, uh, the name the name slips me. Um, guilds. There's also a, a type of socialism where guilds are called, and there's a specific term. It slips my mind, but. Um, uh, 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 syndicalism? syndicalism, yeah, duh, sorry. Uh, yeah, was he a syndicalist then, do you think? Uh, he was very, 
I, he was sympathetic to syndicalism. Uh, he wrote a nice little book right around the end of World War I called Roads to Freedom, where he talked about uh, socialism and anarchism and uh, syndicalism. Uh, his concern about syndicalism was he took a lot of syndicalists, for example, anarcho-syndicalists, yeah. right. to be imagining that, well, the workplace was everything. You just needed to organize the workplace and that was it. Yeah. And he said, no, life is much more complicated than that. There are many areas of our lives that need to be organized. And so uh, he thought, well, okay, syndicalism has got, maybe gotten right for the workplace, but we're going to need all the kinds of other uh, associations. Or we're still going to need government. A lot of anarcho-syndicalists said, we'll get rid of government and the syndicates will replace them entirely. But Russell said, no, you're still going to need government. It's just that you need some kind of organization to organize the economy and other kinds of organizations to organize the government, and so on and so forth. What was his views about the two world wars and the Spanish Civil War in between? I mean, you know, in, here in America, we look back sort of with goo-goo eyes at World War II as the good war vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Korea or Vietnam or the mess in the Middle East now. Uh, did he ever believe that there was such a thing as a good war? Yes, Russell is often mistaken for being a, an absolute pacifist because so much of his work is, was anti-war activism. He was never a doctrinaire pacifist who just believed war, period, was uh, Even though in the nuclear age, he came to believe that war had to be abolished because, you know, it, it, you know, it was like the line, that line from Einstein about, you know, if the next war is fought with nuclear bombs, then the war after that's going to be fought with stones or whatever. Mm. So, but um, when it came to World War One, that was the case where he threw himself passionately into opposition for it, because he thought it was a betrayal of everything that was best in terms of European civilization and everything that was best about his own country and what it stood for. And for him, uh, the um, clearest example of that was military conscription. He thought, you know, Britain's the country that was supposed to be championing the liberal ideas of freedom. And that's why we're opposed to the Kaiser and all that. That's why we supposedly hate him. And now you want to conscript people? He thought that was outrageous. And um, that's what got him uh, involved with the group called the No Conscription Fellowship. And um, he paid a very heavy price for his work with them. Uh, he winds up getting fired from his job at Cambridge University. Uh, he winds up uh, getting uh, uh, fined and then winds up ultimately getting uh, imprisoned for six months uh, for his anti-war uh, activism, for some of the things he wrote. Um, he was, uh, after that, very much sympathetic to the pacifist uh, position and the concerned about the possibility of the next war, and it led him in the 30s to be very wary, like a lot of people on the left, very wary about uh, the calls for Britain to rearm and get ready to take on Hitler, you know, because he thought, okay, this is going to be a rematch of World War I, and, but it's going to be even more devastating. And so he wrote this little book in the 1936 called Which Way to Peace, where basically he advocated a form of appeasement. He thought, uh, it, it, uh, you know, letting Hitler have his way is, is better than the next war, because it's going to be so devastating. And it was a position that he ultimately came to regret. And in fact, when the war broke out, uh, he publicly uh, wrote a, uh, a letter, which he sent to the newspapers, where he just said, you know, I disavow the position. I'm, in fact, ready to support it, because he thought he came to realize that, you know, Hitler was not the Kaiser allowing something as monstrously evil as Nazism to dominate the world. Uh, war was something that was worth fighting to prevent. What was his view on Stalin and the communists? Well, he uh, was very, very critical of uh, Soviet communism right from the start. I mean, he was like a lot of people, he was happy to see the Tsar fall. People often forget that. They say, oh, those evil communists. But they think about the game before was a mad, vicious, uh, autocratic regime. Mm -hmm. And so when the Tsar fell, he was like, well, who, can, who can't cheerlead that? Uh, who can't be cheering that? And so once he got out of uh, prison after World War I, he got invited to be part of a trade union delegation that went to the new Soviet Union. Um, and we even got to have a personal audience with Lenin while he was there. And most of the members of the delegation were very uh, sort of starry-eyed by uh, about the Soviet Union. They, they basically saw what they wanted to see, but not Russell. And when he came back, he wrote a little book called The Practice of Bolshevism, which was extremely critical of the new regime, even while it recognized at the same time the enormous challenges the regime was facing. 
and uh, it alienated him from a number of his friends who had much more positive, rosy uh, pictures of the Soviet Union, including the woman who was his uh, kind of second wife, uh, who was very, very uh, enamored uh, of the system there. Uh, so, but he never had any illusions about it. And it's very funny because in the 50s and 60s, he gets taken to task when he starts criticizing the United States. He starts criticizing McCarthyism uh, and criticizing uh, the uh, anti-communist hysteria in the United States. And uh, he, I think there's a very funny part where he exchanged in the papers where he uh, has exchanged with the philosopher Sidney Hook. And Sidney Hook accuses him of being sort of naive about how evil communism is. And Russell says, listen, listen to me, little you, you little twerp, you know, when you were the one who was an enthusiastic Marxist back in, back in 20, you know, 30 years ago. I was the one writing the practice of theory of Bolshevik saying, well, I thought Soviet Union had all its problems. You're the one who was starry eyed about it. Now you're the one telling me I'm naive about the Soviet government. Well, I don't think so, buddy. <laughs> well, uh, I, I wanted to ask then, uh, in the early, or well, the first half of the 20th century, say, was Russell then more known for his political views than his strict philosophic views? We mentioned why I'm not a Christian. Uh, at least let's, in the first half of the 20th century, other than why I'm not a Christian, uh, what was maybe his most famous work, pop culturally, and what was his most important work, if they're different? Oh, well, they're very different. Um, his most important book as a philosopher, of course, was the three volume uh, Principia Thematica, which he wrote with uh, his mentor, Alfred North Whitehead. And I mentioned before there was this idea that you could start from some foundations in logic and you could establish the whole of modern mathematics as well. And can uh, I just ask, since it shares the title with Newton's work, was, was this a, a, a building upon Newtonism or was this a refutation? Or was it just the no, same? It wasn't, I wouldn't say. It wasn't either. I would say it was an homage to Newton. I would say it was an attempt to say we're trying to do in this area something like what Newton did in his own field. I think that's the way to understand the title. I mean, they would have you know, admired, admired what Newton tried to do and saw themselves as trying to do the same thing for the, for the field of logic and mathematics. Yeah. So, um, so this was his big work. And you know, it's like a lot of uh, public intellectuals they do some technical work that nobody in the public understands or reads, but that sort of gives them the kind of street credibility to say, I'm a public intellectual now and I can talk about other matters. Kind of like the way, you know, when Einstein talked about popular, popular subjects, people listened to him even though they had the vaguest idea what the heck relativity was. Um, so he wrote a, a number of very influential popular books, probably the two most influential, aside from why I'm a Christian, were a book called Marriage and Morals, which was a very early defense of some ideas that seem very uncontroversial now, like uh, contraception, like the idea of what was called companionate marriage time, the idea that you could just live together if you were a couple without having to get married, uh, to, uh, easy divorce, a lot of ideas that were still very radical but that now seem very commonplace. Uh, the other book to mention as a famous book, a uh, popular book, is one called The Conquest of Happiness, uh, which is a lovely little uh, book on uh, some of the things that stand in the way of our ability to just lead a happy life, and uh, his own analysis of uh, some things to keep an eye out for if you want to read a happy life. So those, those are his three popular books that I would highly recommend to everyone, Conquest of Happiness, Marriage of Morals, while I'm a Christian. Yeah. Um it seems to me that if you look online, you can find some radio broadcasts and even some uh, uh, telefilms uh, with Russell speaking on this uh, on the BBC. Would it be fair to say that he became, after the war, in the early days of British uh, television and even radio, uh, somewhat of a, a media pop star to a degree? Uh, was, was he one of the first philosopher pop stars, do you think? I think that... Um there's a lot to be said for that. Um, for one thing, he was a very good uh, speaker. He was very, very clear. He was very good at organizing his thoughts. And so he was a natural person to put on the radio or on television. If you were to look for a philosopher, uh, he was a very good uh, choice. He would also had a lot of practice because of all of his activism in various causes in uh, being able to uh, speak and write on all kinds of occasions, all kinds of audiences. It also probably did help that right after World War II, uh, Russell was very, very concerned about uh, Stalin 
and uh, the Soviet Union. And there was that brief period between 1945 and 1949 when the United States had the bomb and uh, the Soviet Union didn't, when he actually even suggested the United States should kind of strong arm the Soviet Union into getting involved in some kind of an international, uh, new international order so that we can uh, prevent the next war from happening. And needless to say, you know, um, this was not a, a very pacifist position, but it obviously is the kind of position that uh, endeared him to some people at the establishment who might not have liked him otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so I think it did that also help open some doors for him right after World War II and make him uh, a good t uh, person to select for uh, appearing on the radio or appearing on the TV, that kind of thing. Uh, he died uh, almost 50 years ago. Um, do you think that if Russell was alive today, how do you think the modern media would uh, handle his ideas, his works, his persona? Uh, I think we have a, a we, the term is called dumbed down. Uh, do you think that the subtleties of his ideas between, say, uh, uh, non-religiosity, his political views, uh, the sort of navigating between, you know, being a little favorable towards this, not as favorable towards that, uh, and also his uh, his uh, his stance as a logician would be lost in today's world. Do you th think that he was a product of his times? Do you do you think, in a sense, that, that he lived at the right time, uh, or, or do you think that his ideas have a, a value that would you know stretch and you know had he lived a hundred years earlier, uh, was just born tomorrow, that uh, his ideas would still be bedrock. Well, you make a very good point. I mean, I think in, in the modern times, Russell did have one uh, serious weakness, uh, weakness when it comes to being a popular thinker, which is the fact that uh, his thought ideas could be very subtle, they could be a little hard to pigeonhole, and they evolved over time. I mean, uh, you know, he did live, uh, he was an adult uh, active for 75 years. And so, of course, his ideas changed, they evolved, there were some consistencies, but there were also some uh, changes, and there were some dead ends, some places like where he just said, okay, I was flat out wrong about that, like with, with, uh, with uh, appeasement in, uh, against Hitler. Um, so if you wanted to make Russell sound bad, if you just wanted to assassinate his character, you know, on Twitter or whatever, it would actually not be hard to find you know, something you could point to to say, here's you know, something to show Russell, I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, so in that regard, that would be a serious weakness he would have. But he would also have one strength if he were alive today. And that's that Russell was incredibly good at writing and speaking, and writing and speaking pretty fast. I mean, he wrote a ridiculous amount. Uh, uh, he, you know, he was constantly able to write. So he was the kind of person who could, you know, would have no trouble developing his position pretty quickly, and then he'd be able to get back out there tomorrow on Twitter or whatever and tell you, yeah, this is why you're wrong about that. Oh, this is why I think about that. This is why you're wrong about that. You know, so in that regard, he might be someone who's really, really good at being able to get into these these huge brawls online and be able to actually stand up for himself in a way that some people have a lot of uh, trouble doing. You know, it's interesting that you uh, talk about the man as a logician and his ability to mea culpa, because one of the things I know that uh, I have uh, found in doing interviews, and now you're my 202nd, I believe, uh, and I've dealt with other people with written interviews and whatnot, is especially in the sciences and especially uh, often in philosophy, uh, it's very difficult for people to say that I'm wrong, whether it's about the Big Bang or it's about dark matter or it's about matters of conscience or free will. Uh, it's very difficult for people in this day and age especially to say, you know, I thought about it, I'm wrong. It doesn't seem to have been an issue with Russell. Uh, if we talk about public strengths and weaknesses, does that strike you as something that is a strength or a weakness? Well... As you say, the, the, uh, it is a sign of a great deal of intellectual honesty on his part. Um, if you want to see that demonstrated very, very well, you can check out a book he wrote in the 1950s, which was called My Philosophical Development. Mm. Uh, I, by the way, it's going to be almost impossible even to mention all the books that he wrote in his lifetime in this hour, because he wrote so much. But he wrote this nice book called My Philosophical Development, where he talks about the various twists and turns that his position as a philosopher has took over the decades. And he's pretty honest about where the 
they were dead ends and where he had to have a turnaround and believe something that was very radically different. In fact, his, his earliest beliefs and philosophies were very much a kind of Hegelian idealism, which was a position that he completely uh, repudiated later. Well, let me, let me just ask you, just for those who don't know, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, quote unquote, capital I idealism. What did that mean in the 19th century and what does that mean now? Because people would mistake them, I think. Yeah, I mean, idealism today is often taken to just mean if you're an idealist, it means you believe you have, you know, uh, uh, you know, great uh, ideals about a much better world that you'd like to create, and uh, you really think that's a possibility. It's sometimes considered a little naive, uh, but that's not kind of the way philosophers use the term idealist. A philosopher, when they call a philosopher an idealist, uh, what it means is that they believe that. Uh, Ultimately, the universe is made out of mind. So, uh, for example, what really exists is the mental, it's not the material. And so there are philosophers who believe, for example, Barclay, that uh, everything that exists around us it is just perception. It's just perception that's happening in the mind, and that's it. And Hegel believed a version of this, or a, a version associated with him. And uh, Russell and a number of other British philosophers of his day were quite taken by Hegelianism. And then Russell came to repudiate that. He wrote a nice little essay, which is in the line, I'm not a Christian. It's, uh, it's, it's a, he, he evokes a line from Hamlet. The essay is called, Seems at a nay it is, uh, which is a very nice um, uh, statement of his kind of refutation or his repudiation of this idealist uh, position in philosophy. Um, let me ask uh, about, uh, I guess, a speculative uh, question. Uh, in my mind, rightly or wrongly, from when I was young and I, I would read, I'd have my modern library, European philosophers and whatnot, and I'd read a, a lot of times the, the portable so-and-so. Uh, I always got the idea that Russell, uh, in my mind, I associate him with a, a 1938 or so film called Things to Come, based on the H.G. Wells book, and John Cameron Menzies, the actor, talking about how mankind will stride out into the universe, conquering this, conquering that. Man cannot be stopped. That uh, when I think of when I think of Russell, I, I I I think of his view of life being sort of that way, not necessarily idealist, but that he was far more optimistic than pessimistic versus a lot of the continental philosophers that I spoke of before that have the exotic names and the you know Sturm und Drang. Uh, is that a, a proper uh, idea, or was that something misplaced? Would you would you put Russell as someone optimistic about mankind, science, the future? Well, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, what, it's very difficult to answer because I think there are two things about Russell that were both true at the same time, and they don't sit together comfortably all the time. One is that Russell thought that what was possible for human beings was. Uh, enormous progress. He thought we had made a lot of progress. He thought that enormous progress was possible. He thought that war could be abolished. He thought the human race could be done with war, the same way that they were more or less done with duels, for example, or things like that. He said, we can say that's a superstitious practice. We can get rid of it. And that sounds really optimistic when you think about it. Uh, but at the same time, he was also extremely conscious of the extraordinary level of stupidity and superstition and barbarism of which the human race is also capable. So he has this delightful little book. It's called The History of the World in Epitome. And, and I, can, I, can, I can recite for you the entire text of the book. The book, it says, Ever since Adam and Eve ate the apple, man has never refrained from any folly of which he was capable. The end. That's the whole book. And of course, it's got a picture of the mushroom cloud at the end there. So you knew exactly what he was talking about. So, uh, so uh, he was someone who was very aware of just how irrational and stupid human beings could be. But he was also very, very uh, inspired by mankind at its best, and, or human being, humanity at its best. And we don't know what thought human beings could be if only uh, we could just make it happen. Uh, taking that... Uh as a base and going off on a, a slight tangent, what do you think that Russell would have thought, say, of modern genetics and the ide ideas of uh, personal responsibility nowadays vis-a-vis -vis what was known 70, 80, 100 years ago when he was in his prime? Do you think that he would be someone 
who, well, what were his views on free will, and do you think they would have changed knowing what we know now in modern science, pro or con? Well, Russell was, from a very early age, uh, someone who uh, was a, what we, philosophers would call a, uh, a, a sort of material. I get in trouble with some Russell scholars I say this because it's a little more complicated than that. But basically, he thought the world around the world is, don't have like immortal souls or anything like that in us. And part of that, for him, was a rejection of free will. Uh, this is something, a position he came to as a teenager. It's an interesting story. Um, Russell's grandmother, uh, who raised him because his parents died when he was very young, uh, and his grandmother was very religious, and he couldn't talk about anything uh, of his doubts about religion with her. So he was studying Greek, and he had this little, as a, as a, well, a teenager, and there's a notebook labeled Greek exercises, and he would write out in Greek all of his thoughts about doubts about God and free will and all of that in there, uh, because he knew none, none of his family members would check it. So, uh, where he first decided, he has a teenage boy that he did not believe in God, did not believe in the afterlife, did not believe in free will. So he was very sure of that from a very early age, and it was for him it did lead him to reject the idea of punishment. Uh, except from a sort of purely utilitarian uh, perspective. Uh, he thought that one of our most dangerous ideas uh, was the idea of sin. You know, the idea that we just had, you know, which he's connected to this idea that there's this kind of devil that can crawl into us, that, that we just have to exert this this uh, superhuman effort of will to just make ourselves be good. And he thought that's dangerous. Um, uh, now, there are philosophers now who think that, well, it's hard to throw out the idea of free will and keep all of the nice ideas you want to keep, Russell. I think someone like, for example, Daniel Bennett, the philosopher, would uh, take that position. But for him, uh, he thought um, the return of free will was a liberating. Hmm. Um, let me just, uh, uh, as we sort of wrap up the interview. Let me talk about uh, his life, death, and legacy then. Um, he died, like I, I believe I said, uh, he was almost uh, 100 years old. Uh, so he lived almost a full century. Uh, the old man, uh, was, you said how he evolved. Uh, was there any particular uh, belief system that you would say uh, that he totally rejected, that he had previously subscribed to. I mean, you, we, we can talk about his uh, ideas on politics or, or communism and, and whatnot, but I mean, at, at, at a more base uh, philosophical level, uh, logically, did he, you know, people talk sometimes about deathbed conversions, about some, uh, or was he uh, going to the grave basically still believing in logic, still believing uh, that, you know, the things that we've talked about? Well, he certainly never had any kind of living in life conversion to a radically different position. I mean, you know, that happens all the time. People get, atheists like him are, uh, people suspect of having one of those kind of uh, deathbed uh, conversions. So he certainly never differed, uh, deviated from being uh, an atheist uh, with left kind of politics. Probably the biggest change that happened in his political thinking was. Uh, you know, he grew up in the Victorian era as a white man, and uh, like a lot of white men from the Victorian era, he had some very, very, um, I will say, unpleasant ideas about race that he just uncritically inherited when he was young, and that occasionally popped up in his early ideas. You know, for example, he kind of accepted a version of white man's burden as a young mm -hmm. man, the idea that... Uh, uh, you know, they, that it was the job of the white race, European races to teach civilization to the Africans and that kind of thing. And you know, again, he was kind of uncritical about it. But if you look um, at his late life, uh, you see he was strongly affected by the things that he had seen, by, by things like the, uh, the racism of the Nazis. And so by the 50s and 60s, he's a strong supporter of the civil rights movement in the United States. Uh, he is a strong champion of, uh, of uh, Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress. He's trying to write letters, trying to get Mandela out of prison and things like that. So there, I would not call that a repudiation of uh, any kind of uh, considered position on his part, but it was a way where I think, you know, you saw him grow out of some ugly uh, inherited prejudices uh, in a way that they were more consistent with his more humane kind of ideals. Since you've written of the man's life as well as, well as his ideas, let me just ask you a question that's not navel-gazing, but I often sometimes will talk with artists and say, you know, 
you cannot you cannot uh, talk about the artists and their stated position in a work of art or, or whatnot and then expect expect them to be saints i mean i use an example of someone like uh, caravaggio who was a drunken murderer or or reina maria rilke who wrote this wonderful uh, aesthetic poetry but was basically a, a, a lousy cheating scumbag in his personal life um Bertrand Russell, I know, was married four times. Was there any sort of schism between the views that Russell espoused in public, or was he like a low-down poon hound, you know, <laughs> sneaking about on his wives? Russell's, uh, Russell's love life is another hour long, uh, yeah. well, by itself, honestly, because yeah. he, did, he was very active over, over his adult life, you know. Um, the, short, the short answer is the following. Um, he was a very naive uh, boy, or met his, his first wife. Uh, and it was a very, very poor kind of match. One of the things that happens when you're a naive, sheltered boy and you meet the, you, and you fall in love with the very first woman who takes an interest in you and you marry her. That often doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, and it didn't work for them. Uh, and it was a very, it was kind of sad. It took, unfortunately, it was a marriage that took 20 years to die. It should have died pretty fast, but it took 20 years. Um, his second marriage uh, was an open one. Uh, and it was one where uh, I think the two parties involved were not as clear on their own and honest about where they were at as they should have been because they had very different understandings of what an open marriage meant. His wife thought it meant, I'm going to go out and sleep with another man and have two babies with him. Uh, Russell was like, um, maybe not. No, maybe that's not what an open marriage means. And so that resulted in a blood, bloody explosive divorce. Um, the third marriage uh, was to a woman... 38 years younger than him, and uh, was a bit uh, uh, tempestuous from what we know about it. Uh, but uh, his fourth and last marriage was the, uh, the happiest. That was that he was married uh, until his death. And if you read his autobiography, which I highly recommend, uh, there's a lovely little poem at the beginning, uh, de a dedicating book uh, to Edith, to his fourth, uh, his fourth wife. So I guess you could say it only took him four tries, but um, he seems to have gotten marriage right eventually. Um. Russell has a society named after him. I don't know if you're involved with that in any way. So let's talk a bit about his legacy. I don't, obviously, there are people around the wor world uh, interested or dedicated enough to him to have formed this society. Uh, aside from that, which someone could write off as just maybe fandom, uh, does he have a lasting legacy? legacy? Does he have... Uh, descendants, you know, uh, Darwin had his famous bulldog, T.H. Huxley. Are there Russellian descendants today? Oh, yes, very much. Um, I should give a plug because, I mean, not, not only am I involved with the Virgin Rock Society, I was in fact... And I'll link to it below this video along with your webpage for people. So I would ahead. appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, so I, I was, I'm, I'm there very much uh, plugged in. I mean, we might be fanboys, but I don't think we're uncritical uh, fanboys. Um, in terms of uh, people who I see uh, as sort of carrying on uh, the Russell tradition, uh, one figure that I often mention is uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, who is in fact an honorary member of the Russell Society. And I think he, in many ways he is the kind of public intellectual that Russell would admire, and one who shared many of the same interests and concerns and, and ideals. You know, uh, Politically, they were very similar in terms of their criticisms of war and imperialism. They were interested in many of the same areas of philosophy, and they both display the same kinds of um, public intellectual uh, fearlessness. Um, doesn't mean they're right 100% of the time, but you can still sort of admire the ideals they stand for and the extraordinary level of dedication and courage I think they put into it. So Chomsky's the big red by point to uh, more than anyone else. Well, just as a closing remark, uh, if you were to... Uh speak to younger people who have never heard of nor read Russell, uh, what would you recommend uh, the you know three or four works that you mentioned the most popular works uh, but uh, if you you had to select you know a, a handful of the core works for people to read, what would you recommend then? Well, I mentioned three of his most popular uh, works, why I am not a Christian uh, the uh, Barish Morals and uh, 
I'm blanking on the third book I recommended, uh, The uh, uh, Compass of Happiness. Um, if you would like an introduction to Russell, the philosopher, uh, two very accessible works that do not require any background in philosophy at all are uh, a little book, he, introductory book he wrote called The Problems of Philosophy. It's a small book, very easy to read, very nice introduction to some problems in philosophy. Uh, and then also his much bigger book, the History of Western Philosophy, which is again written for non-specialists, uh, where he talks about the whole history of philosophy going all the way back to the Greeks into the 20th century. Uh, and uh, it's marvelous prose uh, there. So if you wanted an introduction to Russell the Philosopher, uh, those would be some, uh, some very good places to go. And your book is one that you wrote and also edited? Uh, uh, yes, this is a book, I'll show it again here. This is Bertrand Russell, Public Intellectual. And uh, it is co-edited by me and my friend Tim Madigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote a number of the essays in there, including uh, an introduction where I talk about who Bertrand Russell was, a longer essay where I talk about the political Bertrand Russell, the political side of his life. But you also see talk about Russell as an educator in there, because he actually founded a school, and at one point you find talk about his anti-war his anti stance, his activism, his career as a public speaker, that kind of thing. You see Russell talked about quite a number of ways that really captures what he was like as a public intellectual. Well, I will link to both your webpage and the Russell Society below this video. Anyone wanting to find out more information about you, him, or both uh, can look that up. So thanks for spending about an hour talking to me about the life uh, and ideas of Bertrand Russell. I'm happy to do it. Happy to do it. Thank you.